Hey everybody, welcome back for another video about the Rhythm and Time Toolkit. So today I'm going to talk about modules. These are patches that provide a UI and patter system support for almost all of the RTT objects. The point of them is to make your patching with RTT fast, easy, fun, and creative. When I started this project, well before I had any intentions to share these with other people, my goal was to make my own patching more fun and more musical. I have worked a lot with drum machines. I've done a tiny bit of modular synth stuff. I've obviously worked in a in a DIW. And I like that process of making music, right? Working with technology to make music, which is different from programming, right? So a lot of my own personal goals with RTT were to kind of be able to differentiate those two parts of the process. On the one hand, the programming, and then on the other hand, the music making. And the objects themselves definitely help with a large part of that because they have kind of very complete functionality and they have there's a, an API, I guess you could say, a, ta a way by which they communicate with one another. But of course, another big piece is all of the plumbing that you have to wrap around objects in your match, max patch in order to control them and to be able to save the state. So the UI and the pattern and preset support. So that's where modules come from. Um, like I said, almost every RTT object has one. And there's an example of one right here. For an overview of them that you can explore and play around with, I recommend this rtt.help.modules page. You can get to this either from the package launcher or by going to extras, rhythm and time toolkit, and then selecting rtt.help.modules. For the help file also of each patch, there is a page that contains the module and has some information about how to use it. What I'm going to do today is just work with a fresh patch and show you um, about this. So let's start by making a new module. So the way that you do it is you type in a name of an RTT object, and all you do is omit the tilde. So if you have no tilde, you're going to create a module. And you can see that it already resized itself. The result is that you have a patch that once we convert this patcher to a B patcher, is a really nicely built little UI that allows us to control the object inside. So if I create a scope here, you can see that we have a clock phaser now at 120 or 158, now 120 beats per minute. Now you'll see that when I created this, it gave it this name here at the top, clock underscore 66167. Every module has to have a name. And the reason is really related to the patter system. So the patter system is kind of the key in this, uh, inside these modules that basically make it possible for us to have an object that lives inside of the module that can be talked to in lots of different ways. So one way is from the UI itself that's in the module. But another way is actually we can, you know, save presets. So if I create a pattern storage object and I double click, oops, I have to give it greedy attribute, greedy one. And I double click, you can see that we can actually see the parameters of this clock 66167. And so the fact that this has a name allows us to, you know, have two of these, for example, and have them be recognizable separately. So we have clock 66167 and clock 48680. Now, when you create a module like I just did, and you do it the, the exact way that I did, just go this far and then hit enter, it will automatically give it that name. In general, it is a little bit better to give it your own name. And the reason is simply because the pattern system will do a better job of persistently recognizing that same um, patch. So my strong recommendation is when you create a module, say the name of the module and then, or the what the module is, and then give it a name. So we'll say my clock. Transform batch to beach patcher. 
Now, if I go into my pattern storage, you can see that we have my clock. So you just want to do that. That's a you know that's best practice. Always give uh, your modules a name. Once we have that, we've now unlocked a bunch of pretty cool functionality. So one thing is I can just send messages straight into the module the same way that I would if it were an object. So if I wanted to have some modulation or something and I wanted to just send values remotely into the module, I can. And you can see that the UI is getting updated. It's also possible to talk to these modules completely remotely. So I could stick this number box over here. And then I can go into this tiny menu here and select the BPM parameter. And you can see that it's going to create this patter object that has two arguments. So one is bind to, and then the name of this, or the address, I guess you could say, of that particular parameter. And then the second is this invisible attribute. So together what these do is basically make a pattern object that's kind of like a remote controller for some parameter somewhere else in your patch. So now if I, uh, if I connect this number box and then I change the value, I'm going to zoom in a little bit because it's probably pretty tiny. you could see that I'm changing the value of that parameter inside of that module. In addition, I will also get the val oops, I will get the value out. So if I change the VPN parameter, you can see that I'm getting that value. And one thing that's really good to do in general is just to send a set message. Like if you're going to make one of these remote controllers and you have some UI object, whether that's a slider or a number box or whatever, just send it a set message which is a very common message that pretty much every UI object in Max accepts that has the effect of updating the display of a UI object without causing any output. So this allows this UI element to remain perfectly in sync with this UI element without causing a loop that creates a stack overflow. If I change this one, now you'll see that we're act we are sending that value through, so we're seeing it reflected here. But if I send, if I change it anywhere else, I could even have another one of these if I really wanted to. You can see that things are generally staying, or in fact, they're 100% staying in sync with one another. So that's really one of the powerful things about this, um, these modules is the ability to, uh, to remote control the to remote control them. One use case that I use a lot in my own work when I do performances is I use Mira. So if I if I pull up a mira.frame object here, you can see we have this thing that looks like an iPad. And what you can do basically is have an iPad that you pair with um, this mira.frame object. So you run this Mira app on your iPad, you tell your iPad within the Mira app to look at this particular Mira.frame. And then you can use one of these patterns and send that set message to keep the UI object updated inside the Mira frame. And now what will happen is I'll have an iPad with this slider on it and I can control my sequencer from my iPad and my UI stays in sync. So if I want to tinker in the max patch and fine tune things there, then all those changes will be reflected on the iPad and vice versa. The same goes for a MIDI controller that you might be using, or even just a, you know, kind of a, a live UI that you might be making in max that doesn't expose all of the parameters of the sequencer, but exposes the ones that you want to be able to play with or if you wanted to say map multiple parameters to a single control and do some weird stuff where you have you know one slider that controls multiple parameters then you can do that using this capability uh, and the modules make it very easy for you to just talk directly to any um, any parameter within any module by just using that drop down menu Um, I'll create one more here. So RTT loop, um, we'll just call it loop one. 
Unfortunately, there's no easy way to invoke just the B patcher, sadly. So you have to do that transform patcher to B patcher thing. Cycling 74, if you're listening, please make that easier. Um, the other thing that is very easy, thanks to this integration of the patter system, is presets. So you saw already that we had this patter storage with greedy, and we can see all of those parameters. But in order to actually save presets for my patch, or scenes if you want to call them that, so that when I'm performing live, I can recall a given state, or so that if I have a composition, I can kind of conduct or direct that composition, um, we need to do some other stuff. And there's an easy way to do that, which is to come into the snippets menu and search for rtt.patter helper and just pull that into your patch. And if I now save this max patch, let's call it modules.maxpat. I'm going to overwrite. And then I bang here. You can see now we have a patter storage object whose name is the same as our patch. So if I open the inspector here, you can see that this pattern storage is named modules and this preset object is linked to that pattern storage. And now I can save some presets. So I'll save a first one here. I'll change a couple of values. I'll save a second one. And now I can easily shift between those states. I'm going to zoom in for you again. So you can see we're flipping back and forth between those. I could also, this is, I don't want to make this too much of a, a patter tutorial, but one thing that is really cool that the patter system can do is actually interpolate. So if I start from one and then I use floating point number, you can see that I'm actually gliding, interpolating from preset one to preset two. There's a lot of features that Powder Storage has along those lines. I'm sure I'll do a video at it, about it at some point. We can also see the, uh, patter presets by clicking this presets button. And so that's all the ones that you have saved. And these presets are going to get saved to a file that lives usually in your folder next to the max patch. So if I try to save this patch, it's actually going to pop up this dialog window. And it's what this is saying is, where do you want to save those presets? So I'll say save. I already have that file saved, so I'm going to replace it. And now I can actually, we can look at that. So if I create a dict object, um, I think I can do this. And I double click. Oh, no, that didn't work. Let's try it. Read modules.json. Maybe there's like a file attribute. There we go. So there it is. I'm just taking that pattern storage, which is in the JSON format, JavaScript object notation, and I'm just viewing it with a dict object. And typically you wouldn't want it you know, you wouldn't need for any reason to have these two things living together, but just for right now, so that we can actually see that JSON file, um, this is useful. And this pattern helper snippet includes a few things that I think are particularly useful and again, are really designed to just make your patching easy and fast. So there's a few things going on here. One is this clever stuff uh, where the this abstraction here will automatically name the pattern storage object. It will tell the preset object which pattern storage to look at, and it will just use the name of the max patch. Um, it also has some attributes set that I think are the best attributes. <laughs> so auto restore one, which means that when the patch is loaded, this pattern storage object will save the most, or sorry, will load the most recently saved JSON file. Save mode two, which says anytime that I save this max patch, also try to save the pattern storage file, which is why when I saved this patch, it popped up that window because I didn't have a pattern storage file saved at that time. So it said, hey, where do you want to save this? Um, because that attribute is set now, anytime that I save the patch, it will also save pattern storage. So if I create another preset here, let's do that number three, and I can obviously switch between them. If I now go to file, save, and then I read modules.json again into my dictionary, you can see that we have that third preset saved. So this is really just trying to make it really easy for 
you to have presets or scenes or whatever you want to call them without having to think too hard about it because this I find can really be something that trips a lot of people including me up. So that's pretty much everything about using the modules. There's one final detail that I want to show you which is module presets. So if I go uh, if I create one another module rtt.euclidean transform patcher to b patcher and I click this button here, we get this little window. And there's a lot of stuff here that you can mostly ignore. There are actually a lot of the stuff that's in here is for me. But what's cool is this presets column. And we have a menu with a bunch of presets. Now, I have to admit, not all of the RTT modules have presets. And if somebody would like to contribute to this project and take part in helping to make it better, one thing that I would love it if you could do is make some presets. Um, and we'll include them in a future update of the package. But basically, we can you know load some uh, some presets of the module. So let me just do that. Let's do this Ruchinitsa two. I'm going to click recall, and you can see that this Euclidean object snapped to that those settings. Um, and for Euclidean in particular, these are all taken from the paper, the academic paper on the use of Euclidean rhythms throughout the world. Uh, that I talked about in the Euclidean patterns video a long time ago. So I just basically spent an afternoon making all of those rhythms in the uh, Euclidean module and then just saving them as presets. So you just select it and hit recall, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so Euclidean has it. I don't can't remember how many others have it. Not that many, but if somebody wants to do that, I would love that. Final thing that I'm going to talk about is when to use modules, when not to, and when to use snippets. Um, because RTT actually has two ways to make patching easy. So one is the modules. The other one is the snippets. So for example, if we take rtt.euclidean, the snippet, you can see that we actually end up with something pretty similar, right? We have the RTT object. We have a bunch of UI stuff. And we even have this little sequencer viewer. Um, and it's also enabled for patter. So if I select one of these adder UIs, and then I come into the inspector, you can see that this adder UI has a scripting name, Euclidean slash steps. And this fact, anytime a, um, a UI object in Max has a scripting name and there's an auto patter object included in the Max patch. This allows those scripting name having UI objects to be recognized by the patter system. So if I double click patter storage, you can see we have Euclidean events, Euclidean output, rotate steps, counter. So these are all of these outer UIs that are being recognized by the pattern system. And the reason that that's happening is because A, these adder UI objects have scripting names, which they wouldn't by default when you create them. And B, there's an auto pattern. So if I delete this auto pattern and then I go back, you can see that we didn't get those, um, those. This Euclidean is the Euclidean module, which I'll just delete so things aren't confusing. So we can see that none of these are here, but if I add back in an auto pattern, you can see that they're there. So a best practice is if you're going to use the snippets, you need to include an auto pattern. If you're going to use the modules, then you need to enable greedy for the pattern storage. If I uh, if I disable greedy and then I look at the um, the client window, you can see that the parameters for these two modules are not visible, and that's because of Basically, greedy will cause this pattern storage to look deep into these patches and gather up all of the parameters that exist inside of there. So simple rules are if you have a module, if you're using modules, enable greedy. If you're using snippets, enable auto pattern. Um, it's if you it doesn't really matter. Typically, you could just enable greedy and always have an auto pattern and it should everything should be fine. Um, but, you know, maybe that's the best way to do it. And that's why the. Uh, patter helper snippet does that. Um, the last thing I guess I'll add is there are, is going to be an update to the package 
soon. I don't know exactly when. Uh, I've been fixing some bugs. I've also made some improvements to some of the modules that are uh, very commonly requested improvements. So some of the pattern uh, modules like Euclidean, uh, as well as some of the sequence ones like sequence or notes are getting a pretty cool upgrade pretty soon. Um, so stay tuned for that information. In the meantime, uh, enjoy using this. Let me know how it's going. Let me know if you have questions. The link to the Discord where there's folks who are using the package discussing it is down below. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. And if you want access to other special stuff, for example, I made some videos last week on a clone of the Buchla B281 uh, module in Gen. Uh, that's available on Patreon. So if you join the Patreon, you can get access to some extra videos like that. I think also probably at some point we will have some RTT extras for Patreon subscribers, like perhaps some extra modules, some extra examples. So just more patches, more resources, more stuff for RTT. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Have fun and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.